Whenever I was nine years old, uh, there was an event that happened that would pretty much change my life, that would change my family's life, that would make things a little complicated to, uh, I guess, to, to make it through the future, man. Like, at the time, like, I looked at the future, and uh, most people, they, you know, you, as a teenager, you think of growing up, and uh, as a son, having that son and father connection, and uh, learning from your dad, like, all the things that, uh, you know, a dad would teach you. You know, one day, my dad, he'd build my house, or my dad, he would, uh, you know, he, he, we'd build a car together. You know, things that father and son do, but that was taken away from me uh, whenever I was nine years old uh, at this intersection right here. My parents, uh, to me, uh, mean pretty much everything, you know, because um, if they hadn't have got together and, you know, took the time to conceive me, you know, I wouldn't be uh, here today. So I owe them my life. And, and what's special about um, myself and Matt's life is that uh, you know, we lost our mom at a young age um, to cancer, so I, I was nine years old um, and we were in the room when she died and, you know, our dad was there and, and I can imagine the feeling of, of being a parent and going going through that um, and being a single parent. So, um, but ever since then, in some weird way, um, I've always uh, thought that she's made us stronger uh, in some sense, uh, in a, on a spiritual level, like I think I'm closer to her than than, than words could even ever describe or anybody could even ever understand because I often think about like what our lives would be like if, if she hadn't got sick and and went through all that um the cancer and just all those sad days and just uh... you know when I think about parents obviously the first thing that comes to my mind is uh, my mother who actually died when I was 12 Jeff was nine uh, you know we didn't get to know her as well as we would have both have liked to she was uh, a wonderful woman from the little bit that we didn't know. She was just a very classy, very classy, elegant lady. And I remember thinking, like, whenever she she got cancer and, and died, I just thought it was, it was very strange. It was very unfair. I mean, for someone who had never smoked at all or, you know, never done anything bad, besides not just doing anything bad to their body, I mean, never done anything bad in general to other people, I thought it was really fair and, and very strange that she was, she was someone that, that God took away from us. But... Who knows, you know, maybe things happen for a reason. Being a parent is something that you're never ready for. I don't care how many classes you take, people tell you, it's scary. There's, there's, there's nothing to it. Being a parent is, is rough. Pretty much my dad, he was, uh, I guess you would say, he, he was like any other father. He would go out of his way to try to provide for his family. Um, just my memories of my dad was just, it was more, of him working. I mean, all the memories of my dad was just him coming home, um, you know, off his daytime shift, you know, even vacations or whatever that me and my mom would go on. A lot of times my dad wouldn't, he wouldn't be able to go because he was, you know, he had to work. If my dad could go out and bust his ass, if my dad could go out and he could work two jobs, manual labor, building houses, you know, working in a plant, um, doing these things that really wear and tear on people. You know, there's no reason for me, you know, to, to sit back and go, well, you know, and feel sorry for myself and go, well, you know, I can't do something. You know, I look at wrestling as being blessed because it's actually fun. You know, I'm not out slaving to, to uh, you know, make a dollar like my dad did. But then my dad, my dad uh, is just, the, uh, you know, he's my hero. I've said that, you know, tons of times and I'll continue to say that. Uh, for the rest of my life, and um, even after he's gone, I mean, he, he is my hero because he has uh, been such a role model and such a a good father um, to to go through that. I was nine, Matt was uh, twelve, and and just to 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 continue on to work his ass off just so we could you know um, get a car and have, and go to school and and have the things we need to that uh, eventually led us to um to be what and who we are today. Although our dad was a very Old school, hardcore country boy. Uh, he raised us hard, uh, you know. And when he he cussed, he cussed. And uh, you know, he's still not afraid to cuss. He will cuss like crazy. But he's a uh, he's a very good man. He's a very honest man. A very hardworking man. And uh, his word is his bond. Uh, I think it's kind of cool that you know um, he never remarried. Um, it, it wasn't that important to him because. Uh, that's one thing we had in common with Shannon, you know, in all this parents episode, it's always cool to talk about because uh, his, his mother never remarried either. 
and that's why we've had such a kind of a close relationship. But I'm um, sure he dated and at first, you know, it was weird for Matt and I when we were younger, but like as we grew, we grew older and we matured, um, we was like, wow, you know, it wouldn't have bothered us probably um, if he would have gotten married, but like uh, props to him for not doing that. And he's, he's still still a good guy. He uh, goes through these modes where sometimes during the winter, he'll almost get in like these depression modes and when it warms up a little bit, he'll kind of kick out and he'll be happy and he'll be good crazy old, you know, wild Claude G. Hardy, the legend, you know, so we're actually hoping he'll get back into that zone again. I mean, he's, you know, he's older now, actually this year he'll be 78, if I'm not mistaken, or 77. So as a kid, uh, you know, nine years old, uh, the fact of uh, not knowing if your dad's gonna make it through the week or not, not knowing if you're gonna have a dad whenever you wake up the next day, like it's pretty uh, breathtaking. So right here behind me, this is the intersection that my dad was uh, hit by a dump truck. Uh, he was heading to work to provide for us, his family, and a dump truck crossed the intersection right here and clipped my dad. And they spun my dad out in his car and threw him out. He landed in the median right here, and that's where his injuries come from. He landed on his head and it was all enclosed brain injuries. Um, there were some people on the scene that seen, seen it happen and they said that my dad actually stood up after he landed and then collapsed. And that was the last time my dad ever walked. He had uh, several blood clots on his brain uh, that had to be removed. Um, he, on the way to the hospital, he, he died and they had to bring him back. Um, once he got there, they, they didn't think he was gonna make it. You know, uh, my mom, she uh, she said that, you know, and she got the phone call, they just said that they didn't think he was going to make it, that she needed to get there as soon as possible. Um, whenever he got there, they did several emergency uh, surgeries on him and uh, tried to remove some of the blood clots on his brain and uh, everything. His brain stem had been snapped and uh, it was damaged real bad. And uh, I guess that's that was one of the reasons that, you know, he, he was paralyzed. And I definitely know that our mother dying young played a huge part in the development of uh, both myself and my brother Jeff as, uh, as we grow older. And for the longest time, we lived our life uh, very much kind of almost like in, um, you know, in honor of her. You know, things do happen for a reason. I think that, that her death uh, may very well have been the reason. You know, we've had such great success and, and maybe for, um, you know, uh, those of you who are Christian or uh, extreme church go goers, and maybe you know, a lot, a lot of people said, you know, maybe God just needed her. Maybe she was that that special that she she was, uh, you know, she she was far more important in, in heaven than she was on, on earth. So, for some of you, you might not know this, but I actually have a 14 year old son. His name is Isaac's Wright. Um, he's probably the greatest thing that I've ever done in my entire life. From the time that he was in his mom's belly, I'd remember that I'd love to rub it. It was, it was something that I, I, every night before, the only way she'd go to bed is I'd have to rub her belly. And uh, it just felt something wonderful because in nine months she would just grow and grow and grow and Isaac would kick and he'd punch and he would drive his mother nuts and you know, and then, you know, and the funny story is Isaac was supposed to be a girl. So, uh, you know, when my son came out, you know, I held him like it was just, I mean, he really was actually was like more like this. He was only about this big. I mean, it's just like a little tiny little baby, you know, and the, the nurses will never forget me because I'd like raised him up in the air and was screaming like, I have a son, you know, I mean, being a parent is probably like the greatest thing you can ever do. Um, you'll have your ups, you'll have your downs, you'll have terrible twos, teenagers, but you know, this is a legacy that I'm, I'm going to pass on. You know, my son will live and I will live through my son, but to watch your child grow, to, to become, you know, the teenager that my son is and the man he's going to be one day, to become married, it's it's great and it all it all becomes, be, you get to turn around and do something like my father did for me. 22 years in the army, he was the greatest single parent I ever had in my life. He raised myself and my brother. I mean, you can't ask for something better than that. He, he, he gave me the gift to give to my son, to be a parent, to be a father, to be a mentor. You know, to love something that's just, you know, no matter what he does, he's always going to be my son. Um, I, I know this sounds crazy. I mean, neither Matt or Jeff Hardy would drink or, you know, do anything. 
and that was because our mother was like that. We didn't we didn't cuss for so long. It's it's actually so funny. You ask some of our younger friends, and even if you asked uh, uh, Shane Helms, who I've been friends with forever, at first like we would never curse around him, and it would freak him out. He like thought we were weird because we wouldn't curse. There was only one actual word we would say, and uh, I don't know why we thought it would was okay, but like our dad would say, it, we'd say, "Oh, that cocksucker," and like. Obviously, that's a bad word, but like that would be the only curse word we would use. Everything else was like off limits because our mom didn't curse. That's what's so exciting about life, and I consider it the second stage of life is when uh, you do get to that point to where you're eventually able to, to um, you, you know, be a dad and be a mom um, to actually uh, take that take on that responsibility of, of raising one of your own. So, um, so thanks to them, um, I have that chance to do that uh, myself, and and that's one day I, I look forward to and. Um, and that's what parents are all about, is, is to um, allow generations to continue. Uh, just, I was shooting basketball that day with some of my friends, and uh, my grandma, she was uh, living with us, and she called my friend's mom and just said that my dad had been in an accident and I needed to come home. And I was shooting basketball, and I had a motorcycle that my dad had bought me, like, that year. and. Uh, it was something that he, you know, he had paid on for months and months and months. And uh, I'll never forget just jumping on my bike, just scared to death that something had happened to my dad. And uh, I remember pulling up to the house and I didn't even park my motorcycle, I just threw it down. And uh, I just ran in and my grandma had said that he was in a really bad car accident. She didn't know the details, but my mom was on her way to, uh, I guess, uh, the hospital to see what was going on. And, uh, you know, later to find out was, you know, my dad was in really bad shape. He, he didn't even look like my dad. I walked in, it was almost like a monster. He, uh, his head, just from the surgeries and the blood clots and things was, I mean, it was probably eight times bigger than, you know, a normal human being's head. It was scary. I just remember going in and just looking and I was going, that's not my dad. You know, it looked like something that Hollywood had created. It didn't look like a human being laying in the, in the bed because he was on a respirator and he couldn't breathe on his own. Um, he was in a coma, his head was swollen. I mean, it was just, you know, for a you know, 10 or 11 year old kid to go in there and see this, it was, it was just scary. It was, you know, it was a nightmare. Number one, it's your father. Number two, he didn't look like himself. And, you know, there's, at that age, you're just not prepared for that. You're not prepared for that. Uh, our dad was our baseball coach uh, growing up, and that was cool because, um, you know, um, it's just, I guess, uh, it, it's it's kind of cool. I just wonder what it would be like to be another kid and where their dad's not the coach because we grew up every year, you know, dealing with that. And it just showed, I guess it showed a lot of um, passion and, you know, commitment to what, to baseball, first and foremost. I think that was our you know, number one sport. It's pretty cool, and I'm thankful he, he, he went out there and took the extra time away from his job to make time to um, actually coach us. We lost our mom at a very early age, and he made sure, regardless of what he had going on in his life, that my brother and I had food in front of us, that we had a shelter over our head, and we had clothes on our back, always, you know, and he worked two jobs. He was a, uh, a rural letter carrier, which is a mailman, and he also raised tobacco, which worked in the back as well, and, you know, he brought us up hard, and he wasn't the kind of guy to say, you know, I love you. You know, we didn't get that from him. We would get that from our mom. But, you know, when she died, you know, and it, it was earlier on in our life, like, we never got to that point where we could have adult conversations with her and really understand what I love you means in the terms of a relationship, especially, like, in the terms of a male-female relationship. So I think Jeff and I were, you know, both a little shy when it came to, to dating and seeing girls and stuff in the beginning. And I, I think that was just kind of a... It was kind of a uh, direct effect from us losing our mother at a young age. What I've learned from my parents to eventually um, be able to um, put in use to um, to being a father um, as well and being a parent as well. It's just um, you know uh, not much slack. You know, and growing up with no uh, nothing spoiled whatsoever, knowing when to you know um, do your chores, get your work done, and make sure you get it done. And, and uh, just be an overall good kid and know your boundaries as far as like what to do and what not to do and, and know, uh, know when you're out of line because we always knew when we were out of line and, and we were taught that. The first year he was in a coma for about almost a year. Um, he was, you know, we knew that he was 
we didn't know the extent of it really. We knew that you know he was in a coma, but we didn't know the extent. If once he come out of the coma, if he did come out of the coma, they didn't know. Well, first of all, they just said that my dad wouldn't live two weeks. That was like you know just you can you can count on your dad dying in you know two weeks, and uh, you know two weeks led to a couple of months. Then the next thing you know, they're like, well, there might be a chance. My mom would come home and she would, uh, you know, spend a couple of days at home with us. And then she was right back to take care of my dad. And, uh, you know, we'd travel back and forth just being there with my mom and my dad also. But uh, he stayed there for about a year. And uh, finally, they brought him out of the, uh, out of the coma, uh, the Tom's Rehabilitation Center. They, uh, they were able to bring him to. And uh, whenever he come out of his coma, my mom, I remember my mom saying that he, uh, he actually spoke clearly, like, you know, several words, and that was it. Now, even though he's, you know, he's gonna be in the bed, and he's, he's paraplegic, he can't walk, he can't talk, he's still gonna be there with us, and uh, we were gonna make the best of it. And that was, uh, that was our goal. Our goal was, you know, we're fortunate enough to have him with us still. So we're going to take him home and we're going to, you know, that's our dad. I'm not a gamer at all now, but like me and Matt, uh, Matt and I, we used to, you know, game a little bit back in the day. I'm like, we'll stay with Matt tonight so you can help me, show me what to do to get this low, but daddy wouldn't let me. You know, our dad was saying, all right, you little son of a bitches, you better go to bed right now, you better go to sleep right now, you little bastards. And uh, we we're going, hee. Like, so I pretty much stayed, I was his neighbor, but Matt had a little more uh, lean way or leisure, uh, a little more leniency because he was up near the kitchen. So I'm in there and the governor's trying to get his elbow, but damn, daddy heard and it was like them creepy footsteps. I told you to cut the goddamn game off. Goddamn sorry I shot. We gotta go up and race the rabbits in the morning. You goddamn motherfucker don't do good in school and get your goddamn shorts on because you don't clean up after yourself. As soon as we saw that light flip on underneath the door, underneath the crack of our bedroom door, and we heard him stomping down the hall. Boom, 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 boom. We know he's going for that leather belt, man, and that wasn't gonna be good. And it wasn't gonna feel good. And all you'd see is me and Jeff taking our hands and covering up our asses, going, no, please, oh, it's hurt, we'll stop, we'll stop, promise, promise, promise. Cameron's a small town, you know, and there's a, there's a few antique stores and a couple gas stations and some railroad tracks. And, you know, Daddy's, uh, he, he's, he's been around the state and been to some other states, but he, he's hardcore when it comes to home. I mean, he's homebound because, like, he's, I don't, I don't know for a fact that he's flew anywhere, you know, out of North Carolina, uh, his whole life. So he's really, I mean, he's, he's, uh, when, when, you know, he's uh, very down to Cameron when, when you think about that, because he, he, he protects home and he's all about that. To where me and Matt have been everywhere in the world, but like to him, he's just, he's hardcore when it comes to Cameron. But I think more, he's legendary because he is, uh, he's Claude G. Hardy. You know, he's. Uh, he doesn't matter what any, it doesn't phase him when anybody else thinks, you know, he's always uh, been confident and strong. I think that's rubbed off on us quite a bit. And sometimes it's a little crazy, you know, um, confident and strong to where it's like, whoa, it's, it'll blow your mind sometimes. It's like, wow, calm down, where'd you get that ego from, Dad? My parents are really special. And I was very lucky and very fortunate, uh, you know, first and foremost, that they decided to, uh, to get together and, and create me, much like they created Jeff. And uh, I had two really good people, two great human beings, Ruby May Moore Hardy and Claude Gilbert Hardy, created Matthew Moore Hardy. And just, uh, it's been an interesting life. I'm glad we've had our dad as long as we've had. I hope we have him for uh, forevermore. So as a kid, rushing to your house, not knowing, you know, if your dad was dead or not, like, it's one of the worst feelings that you could ever imagine. He would feel good one day and he might be able to say a few words. I mean, he might be able to say hey or bye or whatever it may be. Um, you know, we had our ways of communicating with him though. I mean, even though he couldn't walk, he couldn't talk, he still knew what was going on. You know, he knew he was still in his right mind because we, you know, pretty much the way we would talk, it would be, you know, blink your eyes for this or squeeze my hand for this or, wink if you know you want this or if you're feeling like this i mean we had our own way to communicate with him and uh, that you know that that went on for that went on for 10 years and we it was great i mean we'd take him to the beach and you know we still did things with him and my mom still got him out and uh, we still wanted to make him feel like you know he was he was still alive 
the doctors had said that you know he might have you know three, two to three weeks to live without this feeding tube, and uh, you know I was like, well, I want to spend you know the rest of his life. I want to be there you know by his bedside with him. You know that was something I was telling myself. But then there was another uh, an another bird on my shoulder just going, well, you know what? I don't want to be. You shouldn't be around him whenever he passes. That's gonna be hard for you. And it was kind of a back and forth thing, and it's hard to explain until you actually go through it. Until you actually you're there and you know that your one of your parents is dying. It's like you're kind of scared in a way to be by their bedside whenever they take their last breath. But then again, you know you want to be there until the end. So it's kind of a back and forth situation. You don't know which way to lean toward. And uh, I'll never forget it, man. Um, I was getting her to head overseas. I was going to Europe. Um, uh, you know, we had a big wrestling tour over there, and uh, I called in. I was like, "Look, I'm not going to be able to make this tour." And uh, they were like, "Well, uh, you know, why didn't you call us last week?" And I was like, "Well, you know, I didn't know that my dad was going to die last week." You know, and uh, they really didn't take it too easy. You know, I, I felt like they really. You know, for what was going on, they were really disappointing me that they would say something like that. Like, I, I went back home, and uh, the following weekend, I was supposed to be on some house shows. And uh, my dad, he um, he was he was still alert and everything, and I just stood there. And, like, one of the hardest things that I think that one of the hardest things for me was just knowing that my mom had went in and told my dad that he was going to pass and ask him if he was ready, if he was ready to go. And whenever I would go in and my dad was laying there and he was still in good spirits, you know, like he was still smiling, he was still, it was just like nothing, you know, everything was okay. I asked my dad, I said, look dad, I said, I'm supposed to be on some shows this weekend. I was like, um, you know, do you care if I go ahead and go knock these couple of shows out and come back and just, you know, and be with you for the rest of your time? And. Uh, he squeezed my hand, you know, yeah, go, and he wanted me to go. I remember getting to the house show, and uh, Arn Anderson, he knew the situation with my dad. I remember Arn told me, he's like, look, he said, you need to get back there with your dad. You need to leave this show right now. He said, I'm calling the office. He said, you're not staying, you're not working. He said, you're going home, and you're going to be by your dad's bedside whenever he passes. He said, trust me, you'll thank me later. You know the old saying, if you never know what you have until it's gone, it's really, really appliable when it comes to parents. Because your parents, there's times where you love them and there's times where you hate them. But you never really know what you have until they're gone. So, to any kids out there, especially I know there's a lot of young kids watching the Hardy Show, a lot of young kids will be watching this episode. There's a lot of adults that will be watching this as well. You know, man, get your, uh, get your mom on the phone, get your dad on the phone today and tell them I love you. And let them, let them know that. And, and show them that, that you love them and, and do what you can, even if you've had arguments with them, if uh, you've had differences, make things work. You know, life's too short, man. Make things work out, you know, and in life, make it a win. I went back to the hospital and we stayed there a couple more days and, you know, finally it got down to the, to the last couple of days to where, you know, the doctor, he knew that he only had hours left. And, uh, my mom would ask him, you know, where he wanted to pass at, and uh, my dad had, you know, pretty much said that he wanted to be at home, and uh, we brought him home, and we sit there for, you know, a day and a half, and it got down to the, to where, you know, we had a group called Hospice in there, you know, helping out with us, and um, they were checking his blood pressure and this, and everything was dropping, his vital signs were getting weak, and, you know, he was, he was getting ready to go, and I remember uh, my, uh, my mom's friend coming in the bedroom and getting me. It was like, you know, three or four o'clock in the morning, her going, you know, you need to come in here. Your dad, he's getting ready to, he's getting ready to take his last breath, pretty much. And uh, I remember being by his bedside and just looking down and just seeing him take his last breath. And uh, that was pretty much it. He was, you know, he was gone. Um, and it was, it was almost, uh, it was sad. But in a way, it was it was a good feeling. It was kind of a crying smile, you know. It's like I was crying, but I also had a little smile on my face because I was going, 
you know, here's this strong son of a bitch who stuck around for 10 years, you know, to see his family, to see my career grow. And there was a reason why he stuck around. And, uh, you know, over that 10 years, you know, I, I accomplished a lot. And I felt like that I proved to him that, you know, he had created something that, you know, that would go on. And that would pretty much, that would live up to what, you know, he did, which was bust his ass and provide for himself and provide for his family. And that was something that I said from day one whenever he was in the wreck, that I wouldn't let him down. And I felt like he got to see, and you know, he got to see for himself that I wasn't gonna be a failure, that he had created something that, you know, he, he was proud of. I wanna thank, uh, I wanna thank my mom, Ruby Hardy. I wanna thank my dad, Gilbert Hardy, for, uh, creating me first and foremost and for giving me such a great life. And as uh, you guys will see, uh, I've got a lot of fond memories of them. And uh, it was a, a major hinge event in the lives of myself and Jeff whenever we lost our mom. Uh, some of you guys will remember the old episode of Reflections. You'll be seeing a lot more of that uh, footage in this episode. And you'll also be seeing one of the reasons I think we bonded with Shannon Moore so quickly because he has a story that's so close and so common to ours because uh, you know Shannon's dad was injured in a wreck and for many many years he was a vegetable and eventually he passed away and you know we never got to know our mom she was taken away from us at a young age Shannon never really got to know his dad that well and he was taken away from Shannon at a young age so that was one of the things that was a common denominator in our friendship and our brotherhood. You know, whenever my dad was put in that position, you know, like I had to step up and I had to be kind of a leader uh, in my family. I kind of felt like I needed to take my dad's spot. Uh, so that's kind of what the dragon, you know, that's what it represented wherever I got it was uh, just pretty much being the dragon of the family and the, you know, the, the most powerful in the family. You know, Matt and Jeff, you know, their, their passing of their mother, you know, that was a, that was a, I guess, uh, something that would strengthen both of them for the rest of their life. You know, they would look at that and, you know, I guess that, that made them thrive to be the best. And, uh, you know, that's the way my father was. I mean, you know, I didn't have no choice but to be the best after this happened to my dad. The closer I got to Jeff, you know, I started being around Matt more and uh, really, at first, I think Matt kind of, uh, you know, he, he looked at me as more of a, just one of Jeff's friends. And then the more time that, you know, I spent with Jeff, you know, Matt was there. And then, you know, I think Matt kind of, Matt was like, you know, and he stepped in. And, you know, I'd heard just Matt and Jeff talk about her. I really didn't ever ask in detail about him because I didn't want to offend him in no way. Um, you know, but, you know, just from... Being young, I just remember uh, a lot of times thinking because, you know, like Jeff and Matt, they'll talk about how creative she was and, you know, as far as, you know, Jeff could draw real good or whatever. And uh, I just kind of, you know, put two and two together, man. And I, I pretty much knew what their, uh, what, what their mom was about. You know, I, I pretty much could, could piece it together. You know, then I was going, wow, she's very much like Jeff. I, you know, I always thought that I was like, wow, I bet. I bet their mom was, you know, was pretty much like Jeff. And then, uh, you know, Matt pretty much took after their dad, you know, Claude. It was something that was bad that I had to either turn into a positive or just give up. And uh, I chose to turn it into a positive and it helped me, it helped drive me to, uh, to be, uh, you know, just to be better. I just felt like I owed something to my dad. I had to provide for my mom. I was trying to prepare myself, you know, a few days before he had actually uh, had passed, you know, on what it, what it was going to be like without him. And uh, there's no preparation for it. There's no no way you can prepare for, you know, your father or your mother to pass away. Um, and I actually thought that I would take it a lot better than I did. And once I got back on the road, um, all I could think about was my dad. Thank you guys for tuning in to the parents episode. And if there's one thing you guys take away from this, I wanted to be this. Your parents are invaluable. You only have one set, one mother, one father. Please cherish them and spend all the time you can with them. You'll never know how important they are 
and you'll never realize how much they mean to you until they're gone. I pray that one day three of my best friends in the entire world, Matt, Jeff, and Shannon, get to know what it feels like to watch your child grow, to hold them for the first time, to find out you know they don't need a pacifier anymore, to take them off the bottle, and to watch them take their first little crawl, or to take their first step, to you know eat their first solid food, you know, I mean, there is nothing better. I say it again, I'll say it another time, and I'm gonna say it one more time. There is nothing in this world that makes me prouder than being a parent. Hello. The parents episode is such an emotional, touching episode to me. Matt and I lost our mom. I was nine years old to cancer when we were really young, which uh, led us to our dad just raising um, us by himself. So that was a extremely intense, strong raising. So it was pretty special to me that he is my hero for taking part in stepping up and raising us one parent, a single parent. I feel bad for any single parent out there, but it takes a strong parent to get through a raising like that. And Shannon Moore, he lost his dad in a car wreck. Tons and tons and tons of times. I would go in the room where Shannon's dad was, pretty much paralyzed, and he could react. I would go in and say, Gilbert, can you, um, uh, Gilbert, hello, can you see me? And he would, he would raise his hand. It was amazing. It was like he was trapped in his body, but he could still hear people talking to him. And just, that's why me and Shannon are so close, because we can relate, because we lost, you know, uh, he lost his dad. We lost our mom at a young age. So once again, that's why I love these parents' episodes. Um, they're very touching and, and just motivating um, to many people out there that can relate that are going through the same thing. And with that said, I have an extremely, extremely, awesome announcement to make what's special is that there is a due date there is a pregnancy and what pregnancy is that it's the love of my life elizabeth Britt. jeffrey nero hardy elizabeth Britt are gonna be parents and that is so exciting to me because you know what i, I consider that the second stage of life. When you step up and you take that responsibility to be a dad, to be a mom, that's when you move up and you take that step to where you're gonna raise a kid. It's, it's, it's scary, don't get me wrong, it's scary, but it's so exciting at the same time. I'm not gonna give you a due date. I'm not gonna give you a sex. I'm not gonna tell you how far she is, how short she is, but I will tell you she's here right now. So Beth, please step in. I just want to say I love you more than words can describe. And the bottom line is a baby's on the way. And we are going to be parents.